This week on Redinger, we talk about the incredible cricket institution that was Channel 9, which was by far cricket's most famous broadcast. And to discuss them, we brought in the man who wrote the piece on their commentary. I'm Jeff Lemon. I'm a cricket writer, broadcaster, talker of Outer. Before Channel 9 cricket coverage, cricket on the TV was looking at people's asses half the time and having radio commentary over the top. Channel 9 invented much of the visual storytelling of our game, and their commentators became legends. And then it all kind of fell away until they ended up as dads talking about pizza. Jeff Lemon is not a dad. He does enjoy pizza. But it was his piece that illustrated just how far the Channel 9 team had fallen. So I brought you here today, Lemon, so we can talk about... Channel 9 Cricket Commentary, which was your <laughs> your breakout piece other than a uh, viral video where you abused Shane Watson in a crowd of people leaving Lords, if I remember correctly. That's spot on. I'm sorry, Shane Watson. I am for real. <laughs> Channel 9 Cricket Commentary was once great. I think that is fair to say it was the gold standard of coverage and commentary for a large chunk of our life. To a point, you can say that. I, I think it was iconic. That's a, a mm. word that I can use for it. I don't think it was always great. I, I think it was often kind of tedious in in some ways in the old style with the old school. You know, there were times when it was boring and there were times when it was repetitive. Mm. There's a massive human tendency to nostalgia. You want to make everything gold and glowing in retrospect when actually the nice thing about it is that you were young and your life still had hope in it. So that's why you like things from your childhood or from your past. But there were great things about it. There were really strong personalities. Billy Birmingham has often said the only reason the 12th man worked was because those voices and those personalities were so distinct. And so people had a really strong response to them and that's why they liked the parody of it. So I think there was greatness at times in that broadcast. It wasn't always great, but... No, no. I think that's fair. It had credibility. It had integrity. And I think that's more important than sort of retrospectively making it great is saying that the people involved with it, it really meant something to them and they really took it seriously and they tried to do their best version of the job at all times. Also, when I say great, I think it's almost like comparing modern computer games with Pong mm -hmm. at a certain point. Like Pong was a boring game, but yep. you know, it was still hugely advanced of what everyone else was. In Australia, we had ABC at the time, and I spent a lot of time looking at old footage of ABC doing the cricket commentary. It was a mm -hmm. very poor production. Commentary <laughs> was usually okay, although it, yep. it did fluctuate a little bit, the quality of the commentary, but it was used. Commentary wasn't terrible, but the whole production, Kerry Packer talking about looking at players' asses because they only had one camera at one end, which England did yep. a similar thing. The difference between that and where cricket went in the 80s, and when you listen to Bill Laurie and Richie Benno in the early 80s. They're not brilliant commentators then. It even took them a few years to sort of come on. Yeah, I, I definitely agree with that. I mean, the technological side of a cricket broadcast, it's something that we can very much take for granted um, and, and not appreciate the way that it works. I mean, these days it gets better and better where the kind of incredibly intimate access that you have to what's going on in the middle of the pitch, it, it can be a really strange thing for people who have watched cricket on TV a lot but haven't watched it live very much. You get to a cricket match and you think, mm -hmm. how the fuck am I supposed to know what's happening? You know, So far <laughs> away in this, yeah, yeah. It, you're right. I know exactly what you mean there. You're miles away and your angles are wrong. You know, mm -hmm. if you come in and you're in the second tier of the MCG at long leg, you're like, well, you don't know how close a ball was to the edge. You don't know how much in line someone's been hit. You know, all you know is that there's an appeal and the finger goes up and you cheer it, but you don't know if that was good bowling or not. You wouldn't have a clue. So the kind of intimacy that we have as television viewers is incredible when you think about the distance from the action that all of that has to start from. And, yeah, that does start with Packer taking over the broadcast and saying, well, we've got to make this a dynamic thing. It can't just be static, you know, one camera watching in the middle that's not going to keep people switched on. But once it's dynamic, once you've got the close-ups, then you humanise the game, then you make the characters more than a name on a scoreboard, you make them a human being. Just the basic thing there too, you know, someone who's worked for ESPN Crick Info and, uh, you know, worked for other organisations, very rarely, it, and this is not a slight on ESPN, but they don't care about cricket. The people that work mm. for Crick Info might. The interesting thing about Channel 9 was that Packer was a actual cricket fan. And he might have been a bit of a random cricket fan. He didn't like finger spin, I remember. During the Rebel Tours, He basically, that's why there weren't that many finger spinners involved. He literally went for wrist spinners or no spinners right. at all. I think Bisham Beatty was like one of the few that he liked. 
But it actually meant, I know it's a random fact that I happen to know, but it basically meant that he came at it from a really cricket perspective, which also meant that you, you talked about it before, quite often on Channel 9, because they were older guys, really, even when they were young, you know, a lot of them had finished playing. In the, you know, <laughs> That's a great description, I think, of Richie Benno. He was an older guy even when he was young. I mean, Richie was born 32, wasn't he? Yeah. I mean, you know, yeah. and probably played in his 50s. But there's a few of them that were a bit like that. They had, you know, and Laurie's probably another one. And they played a long time before. They did have that tendency to get a little bit nasal gay and gay. Actually, that's not even fair. They just got a tendency to be very dull. And Packer would say, no, you have to make the cricket seem entertaining to people. So he was mm. thinking about it as a cricket fan, but also as an entertainer. That did actually make an interesting product. Again, I'll go back to the Pong thing. We are comparing it to what other cricket broadcasts were like. If you watch old English or Indian footage from that period, it's mm. dire. <laughs> I haven't spent a lot of time watching old Indian footage from that era, although I'd be interested to do it. You know, cricket is a sport that has often taken a very long time to move. And in that way has been very susceptible to a small number of renegades. A couple of people can come in and change everything in cricket because nobody else is changing anything. And so it can have a huge effect when somebody thinks about things differently. And so I suppose that's the kind of character that Packer is. You know, he's someone who maybe gets pumped up too much in Australia for being a great man when he was a famous bastard. But he got things done. If he hated finger spin, I suppose that's evidence that he was an unorthodox thinker. Oh, I'm on his side there. But the difference, I think, for us is a lot of people listening to this won't have grown up with the commentary. I mean, obviously, the Australians and, you know, I think a few English fans certainly got a little bit of the coverage. But generally, worldwide, not as many people got it. Hmm. It's kind of hard to understate how big and famous all these people were at that time. It was the TV show you watched in the summer, and Australians didn't really watch that much TV. So if you were going to watch, yeah. it was these guys. To bring up the 12th man again, there's a reason that that was a bestseller. You know, Billy Birmingham got rich. Did he do eight versions of it? Oh, something like that, you know, plus the best ofs and all the rest of it. And, you know, I mean, he's minted from it. He's <laughs> a very comfortable man these days from the proceeds that he made from impersonating cricket commentators. Now, if you'd said this is what's going to make you a celebrity, you know, imagine going to the USA and saying this is what will make you famous, <laughs> this is what will make you rich, as opposed to being iconic in music or film or whatever else it might have been. No, no, no. It's your cricket parodies. That's where the money is. And that's because it was such a big deal. I mean, there are basically three channels in Australia. If you're growing up in the 80s, most places wouldn't even get SBS most of the time. It'd be like, oh, it's a bit fuzzy. You might get Channel Zero, where the ABC was, on one of your TV sets. And then there were the, the three commercial stations and that was it. And even when pay TV came in, there wasn't a very broad take up of it. And there still isn't comparatively. So it's hard to understate how big a deal it was. It's hard to overstate it. I always get confused with those things. Is it hard to overstate it or hard to understate it? It's one of them. It's hard to it state. was a big deal. That's what I'm trying to say. <laughs> well, you could see it also in that period when Imran Khan became a celebrity that was also hmm. parodied on Australian TV. Like, it's brown face now and it doesn't go down as well. But the fact that Imran Khan, who captained Pakistan, was so famous that there could be a parody of him just shows that how big that whole sort of industry was at that point. Yeah, because there probably wasn't a lot else to do, you know, if you're <laughs> in Australia in, in that instance. You've got three channels to watch. You can go outside and run around. If you go outside and run around, there's a good chance you're playing cricket because it's summer and there's not much else to do. And when you come back into the house, you watch cricket. And that was just the way it was. And so I think it can be hard for us as Australians to understand the way it is in countries like England or South Africa where cricket's not as broadly consumed. It's not a part of everybody's life because for us, even if you hated cricket, it was still there. You couldn't get away from it. It was still part of the tapestry. No, definitely. When did it start to jump the shark a little bit? Because when they <laughs> went away from that original call, and there were some very bad callers involved in Channel 9 early on that we've kind of been erased from everyone's memory, the sort of Green oh, Chapel totally days. totally gloss over them because that's what nostalgia does. So <laughs> even some of the characters on 12th Man tapes, who the hell was that? Like, I, I can't say I've got a huge memory of Max Walker being on air or, or the rest mm. of it. And, but you, know, you watch some of the old clips and you're trying to pick who the voices are and there were definitely duds amongst them. But in the end, the core sort of won through, you know, they were the the ones that listeners had the relationship with. So I think there's a bit of shark jumping 
probably as you get into the 2000s, even when you've got that original core. They've been doing it for a very long time. They're a bit tired. Sometimes Bill would still get really pumped up and give it the big ones, you know, last ball of the day, can you believe that? And Tony and Bill would do their shtick and there were times when Ciappelli was sort of, he'd done all of this before and maybe in that last few years, and I think it was the indignity as well of when they were getting those esteemed commentators to flog, you know, whatever reality TV show was Mm. coming up that summer and and having them start to read things out. It starts to go a bit downhill then, but it's probably dating back even a bit further. So I, I remember Mark Taylor saying that at the point that he started commentating, Richie had, he took people on when they joined up, he he schooled them in how to commentate and he oversaw it and he made sure that they started doing the job well. Around about the point that Taylor comes on and from then on, that stops happening. They stop having to be good at commentary in order to commentate. They need to be famous Australian players in order to commentate. I remember talking to Ciappelli and it was after your piece came out and he was talking about your piece and also something I'd written about cricket commentary and he was saying that up until their major producer left, who I've forgotten his name, it was David someone, wasn't it, who sort of was the guiding voice of being very harsh. When he left in the late 90s, that's when they stopped getting feedback. Mm-hmm. And sometimes even Ciappelli would think to himself, I haven't done very well there. And he'd come off air and everyone would be like, oh, it's fine. And he'd think, well, that's changed. And yeah. when that new generation came in with no feedback at all, because, I mean, you and I both commentated with experienced commentators and also players who've just sworn in directly. If you're not helping them, they just get into bad habits and yeah. it's not their fault. It's no difference between them and us. We have to learn as well. I, that's what Chapelli sort of said to me was that the Mark Taylor era was that era where they just stopped doing that, which, as you said, yeah. you were a former player, didn't necessarily matter that you weren't very good at commentary at that point. Yeah, if you were a former player, you were assumed to have the credibility to be allowed to commentate, and it didn't matter if you didn't know how to do it. Now, if you're someone who's never done commentary the same as if you'd never done anything else and you're thrown into a situation where you have to do it, you will copy the easiest way of doing it. You'll look at other people doing it and you'll work out what seems vaguely attainable for you and you'll do that at the most basic level. But you don't actually know what you sound like if you're Mm. talking. And if you're someone who's played a career of cricket, you're not necessarily or you're very unlikely to come off air and say, can I listen back to my work from today? Can I study it and take some notes and see where I can get better? You're going to be clapped on the back and told that you're a great bloke and and off you go. And so that's really where it starts. I think it probably starts with, I think Mark Taylor ended up becoming a very good commentator in his own way, but wasn't necessarily helped to do it. And I think from then on, so you have Ian Healy come in soon after that. It's a few years down the line when Michael Slater comes in and on it goes from there with a lot of ex-players like Brett Lee and Mike Hussey and so on are the ones who start to come in after that. And they're the ones who are not taught how to do it. They're never actually Mm. given instruction in how to commentate. It's just you have to have the name that you have and we have to be able to put that name on the screen. And if we can do that, then it's all gold. It's no surprise that things start to fall apart from there. Yeah. And you see this a lot. So obviously I consulted with ABC when they were sort of shaking up their commentary team. And I've been involved with talk sports system from the ground up as well. One of the things I said was, if you don't have someone who understands broadcasting really well, who is also willing to say to a former Australian or English cricket captain, that wasn't a very good stint. Here's why. And then be able Mm. to take them through it as well and show them why it didn't work and really help them. Because there's no point to saying that was bad, obviously. But the problem that I had seen is, I remember when I worked for ABC, it must have been 13, 14, when I did the South Africa series. Yep. And after the first test, I contacted them. It was the first time I'd commentated for anything other than test match so far. Right. So I contacted them and said, I've done this first test. Can you let me know how I went? And the producer mm. just said, are you a fine? And I was like, I can't work with that. Like, I'm not being rude yeah. or anything, but I don't know how to get better as a commentator with I'm fine. Absolutely. So eventually I went through to Craig Norenberg's actually, sent him an email. I said, you must have been listening. Take me through what I did well and what I didn't and how I can get better. Yep. You have to be a very strong human being to be able to do that to Simon Katic mm. or to Mark Taylor or to any of these guys. But I think you just need to know that it's your job. And so much of the problem is that people are so socially shy about actually being honest. We're so trained to dissemble, you know, to bullshit. It's always be nice Now, there's a very big difference between being unpleasant and being constructive. So it makes sense 
to me, I think because I've spent a lot of my life being an editor of written work, so editing magazines, editing people's books, that sort of thing. And I'm going through the process now of editing my book with someone else. And the whole point is that it's a constructive relationship. So Emily doesn't go through the book and scrub out everything in big red lines and that's it. She'll make cuts and then say, why don't I take this out because at this point you're doing this and in the previous paragraph you're doing this and if we bring this other paragraph up, it runs on better and then we can take this bit and put it down there and that creates a flow. And then I say, oh, shit, that's a great idea. (laughs) I didn't think of that when I was writing it because I was too busy writing it. But Mm. you need someone far enough away from it to tell you what it looks like from a distance. And it's absolutely identical with commentary. I don't know what I sound like. I don't know if it's any good. And like you said, I've never had someone formally trying to teach me how to get better. I've had informal feedback from colleagues who I've asked about it, but Mm. that's the extent that you get. And so I don't think it's specifically a Channel 9 problem. I think it's a a broader problem across sports media in general. You know, there's a lot of terrible commentary in a lot of sports that's based on the celebrity of the commentator rather than the skill or quality of the commentator. And I think Sky TV is probably one of the few exceptions. Their quality is very good. I don't know what their process is behind the scenes in terms of training commentators or if they've just managed to get people who've trained themselves, but, you know, people like Atherton and Hussain who've become outstanding commentators. I don't really know if that's self-driven or or if that comes from the organisation itself. But if you look at, say, a Shane Warne on commentary, he's nowhere near the others as a commentator, but what he's got is a famous name and so that gets him on. And so I think any sports broadcast has that tension between needing to get celebrity on there regardless of whether they're actually up to the job. I remember um, having a conversation with the TV producer in cricket not that long ago and he said you have no idea how hard it is to get someone who is not a big name player like even if they find a smaller player who would be generally known they struggle to sell that person to their owners and all that sort of stuff so it is a problem right I would say that from that Mark Taylor period for quite a few years Channel 9 had this weird almost a dichotomy on air between Mm. sometimes you would have Richie Benno with other people around him that didn't really make much sense but it was still a cricket broadcast and it still gave you the information. You still felt like you were getting the cricket. You might have felt that the commentary had dropped, but, you, you know, yep. that was more for commentary nerds like you and me. I think general people got it. And then suddenly it became basically a reality TV show with a bunch of dads in it. Your line <laughs> is, it's all about being the matiest mates who ever mated. And that was when it became almost unwatchable at times. Mm. And I think in a weird way you can mark this, you know, maybe this makes me sound really conservative, but you can almost mark the difference. The turning point is when people stop being called by their names and start being called by nicknames. Okay, Lemo. Routinely on air. Like previously, the nickname might have come through occasionally. You might have been Chappelle now and then on air, but you would be introduced, Ian Chappell. There was a formality to being a commentator. It was a dignified position. It had gravitas. And then there is a point very abruptly at which suddenly everybody is slats and tubby and binger and that's just become the norm. And then there's this sort of fade out period. And obviously things change pretty fast. Tony Gregg died unexpectedly. You know, he wasn't, well, unexpectedly people who didn't know him, he wasn't an elderly man when he died. Mm. Bill Laurie pulled back and suddenly it was like Richie was a kind of grandmother figure. So if he was in the room, people would behave because they didn't want to be embarrassed in front of Richie. Mm. But as soon as he left the room, then it was frat party time again because it didn't matter. As long as Richie couldn't hear you, then all was well. And so, and that's when it becomes, you know, there's this incredibly boring masculine way of relating to each other. You're not allowed to show any nuance. You're not allowed to have any sort of subtlety. Everything has to be, hey, the boys, here he is, the great man, you know, elbows in the ribs, beer over your head. And it's just this kind of entrenched fuckwittery that we fetishize as a culture in Australia. And obviously it has its versions overseas. You know, there's a very strong and similar British version and so on, where that is how men relate to men in a public setting. And so these men in that setting could only relate to other men in that way. And they were allowed to do it. They were encouraged to do it because the people running the program had exactly the same method of relating to people. Yeah, it's really interesting. I can't remember if it was after your piece came out, but I was in the back of the Adelaide press box, which is, you know, that big press box where everyone sort of hangs out together. It's got the food cafe and everything there. And James Brayshaw came through and another commentator walked past. I can't remember who it was, but they said, oh, heard you hit him hard last night. 
and like they went onto a thing of, oh yeah, sore head today. But and and all I thought was, I now understand why they're doing it on air. Mm. It's the exact same shit conversations they're having off air. Yeah. If that's the case, if you and I have shit conversations in press boxes, that sh- shouldn't be what our broadcasting is. Mm. There has to be a level of difference here. And you realize that it was exactly that. And there was no adult in the room. And I suppose we have to get to the Brad McNamara bit. And hi, Brad. Um, thanks for listening. But you know, we have to get to the Brad McNamara bit a little bit here because it seems like he has taken the brunt of that externally. Who knows? how much Channel 9 pushed the whole matey, matey, mateyness internally and, and allowed him to do it. But there, certainly there was a big change there when someone that they all played cricket with, and Brad McNamara was a very good first-class cricketer. He's never going to make it as a test player for Australia, partly because of the, the kind of cricketer he was and also because Australia was so strong. He's a very good first-class cricketer, mm-hmm. knows everyone, especially because almost all Australian cricketers are New South Wales, and he's a New South yeah. Wales boy. So, you know, he was in a band with Brett Lee. I still have the CD. Mm-hmm. So yeah, there you go, Brad. I've directly paid you for your music career. Uh, one mm-hmm. of the songs is called Totally Average Band. Nailed it. So <laughs> that whole thing is that there's no adult in the room. They think it's funny. They're not the only broadcaster in Australia doing that sort of stuff. Triple M did it on the footy, and then Triple M became a sort of a network around Australia that did it. Mm-hmm. It was a bit of a push around. Yeah. There was almost two sides of things. There was sort of the knowing nerds in Australia, and then there was the unknowing jocks. Yeah. And that was how you broadcast it. I think the main split there, though, is that Triple M was one radio station broadcasting football in Victoria or rugby league in New South Wales. They were one station out of five or six, a lot of the times, broadcasting football codes. Channel 9 was the only television cricket. You know, it's not like there were four other options that you could tune into. At that point, there was basically ABC radio and there was the TV coverage. And so it's a little like when you're playing for the Australian team, you kind of have to stop being a dickhead or you're supposed to because you're representative at that point. Mm. You represent something more than just be yourself or be the fake version of yourself that you think you need to be so that men around you will accept you. You represent something bigger. And I thought that's what they missed is that nine at that point, they thought it was only about the people who were in the room at the time. Mm. They didn't twig that it was actually about 40 years before that And it was about everybody who had a relationship with that 40 years. It was about everybody who had a relationship with the broadcast now who was connected to them. When you're broadcasting to sometimes a couple of million people at a time, that's your responsibility, the audience. And so I think that was the big thing that they lost was that it became purely about you individually, the person, you know, who the former cricketer who played for Australia because that's what you had to be to get in that com box do whatever you want, and that's great because you're great. Mm. There was no consideration of the fact that you actually have an audience and that you're there for them, you're not there for you. And I think that's what they really lost hold of and, and that's where the the sadness of it came in. Yeah, and it's, it's quite interesting if you look at McNamara's career afterwards. I thought Triple M was actually better commentary than Channel 9 was. So mm-hmm. he had moved on and Fox has gone on to be better as well. The- Although it, it has regressed. I mean, it probably was better in its first few weeks and then has gradually bent back towards a sort of Channel 9 vibe. Yeah. It's not as bad, but there are certainly touches of the old character showing through. Yeah, I don't think it's disappeared, but I think that it feels like a much easier listen. Mm. I mean, that was well, my take on Channel 9 cricket at that point was it was fundamentally bad TV. Yeah. Even if you take away the commentary visually and from production standpoint, it looked beautiful mm. and they did some great work with all that sort of stuff. But when it came to actually presenting the cricket, the way that they were putting it together, like even little things like Mark Nicholas would host and he'd have to throw across to people and it was like they weren't the same species. Mm-hmm. And Mark Nicholas would be asking a question to Tubbs about, you know, really, so now I've done it. Mm. I can't even think of him as Mark Taylor anymore. But Nicholas would ask a question to Taylor And you knew Taylor knew the answer because at one stage he was on a New South Wales board, Cricket Australia board, and on the ICC board, (laughs) and he wouldn't even answer it properly. And you're Mm. thinking, Nicholas knows this answer, you know this Mm. answer, and now Slats is going to make a little joke on the other side. Mm -hmm. That's not even TV at this point. Nothing has happened. It has been a minute and 20 seconds of three men standing in front of me. That's all I've had (laughs) here. And it was really, really poor. They even lost the simpler touches of how good the cricket show used to be back when we were younger. I remember Eddie Cowan played a bit of a joke on Ian Healy when he was on the cricket show and he'd like, you know, what's in your bag, Eddie? And Eddie takes out all this stuff and then the last thing he takes out is his book. 
And Ian Healy goes, what's that? Mm. Like he hadn't done enough research on Eddie Cowan to know that Eddie Cowan had written a book, which means yep. he hadn't done any research yeah. on Eddie Cowan. You could just see that it had just stopped being in any way a professionally run broadcast when it came to the commentators and the hosts. Yeah, and I think that's where you really feel like as someone in an audience, you do have some right to get angry because obviously the world's full of people yelling at movies and TV shows and so on that they don't like. And a lot of the time it's like, well, okay, if you don't like it, go and do something else. So for one thing, if you're trying to watch the cricket in Australia, you can't go and watch something else. But the other part being that the people who are put up there to do this job, to deliver this thing to you, have to be willing to actually do the work to deserve that. I think there is a strong sense in Australia that presenting something as treasured as a Test Cricket series is a privilege. You are fucking lucky to be there, to be doing that, whether you're on the TV or the radio or whatever it might be. You've been entrusted with something and you've got to be worthy of that. And that was the thing that didn't work in the, that was pretty much embodied by James Brayshaw being the type who would just well, hey. stroll in. Yeah, having done nothing, having done no research, reading the 11 on the sheet before he jumped on air and not knowing who anyone was, what they were doing, anything about the support staff, the recent history of the touring team, whatever it might be, aside from stats that might be fed through on air. And when you see that, you see someone not respecting the privilege of the position that they've been put in. And I think that's what really got up people's noses. Um, but it was something that had been bugging people for several years, I think, because before I wrote that piece, you know, I used to edit articles on a website called The Raw where readers would write in articles and there'd be a piece through cricket season for three or four years. There'd be a couple every week from people saying, bloody Channel 9 is really giving me the shits. It had been building for a really long time and they all got read and they all got commented on. And so when I wrote the piece I did, I was kind of pulling together all of these threads that had come from a whole bunch of other people over several previous years. Yeah, I want to talk about that. So at this stage, you were commentating for Raw. Had you commentated professionally by that point? Uh, no, I, this was March 2015. Yeah. February 2015, maybe. So it, it got published just before the World Cup. And I did my first professional commentary later that year during the Ashes tour. I did the tour matches on BBC radio. So that was the first time I'd done TV that wasn't homemade calling on the internet off the television. Yeah. Because one of the things I thought was I probably wrote two pieces a week on Cricketable Balls back in the day about mm. Channel 9. I <laughs> Quite early on, 2007, 2008, I would write up the Channel 9 bingo. It yep. was so predictable what was going to happen. Sure. And then probably started to talk about the commentary as it was slipping after that. But by the time it got that bad, I was in an awkward position in that I was commentating. Right. And I felt really weird about writing about other commentators. And I still yeah. don't do it as much as I probably should because it turns out if you don't do it, no one does it. And so it was really good. Did you feel weird that you were commentating or was it because you still felt like such like an outsider it didn't matter at that point? When I wrote it, I didn't feel like a commentator at all. I literally ran a station out of my living room for fun. <laughs> it was entertainment. I loved commentary. I was very interested in the art and the science of it. You know, I listened intently to it. I tried to learn about it, but I'd still had not considered that it was something that I might be able to do professionally. I'd never thought about it. So I think that you're right in a lot of ways. I would have felt compromised if I were writing that piece as a commentator, because it would be like, the appearance would be that it was because I thought I was better than them. Now at that point, I didn't even think we were the same species. I thought they were doing something else completely. Well, I don't mean that in a pejorative way. I mean, I, no, I, know. I didn't relate myself to that world at all. You were literally a bloke on the internet at that point. So yeah. you weren't thinking me and Brayshaw are co-broadcasters. No, and I wasn't thinking like, well, if I can just knock him off, I'll get his spot. <laughs> because believe me, I was never going to get onto Channel 9 even before that. But I knew at the time that I cared about it, but I didn't know that I would be involved with it. And I think I haven't really written about commentary much since then for exactly that reason, that I do feel a bit compromised. You know, I could write about people, but it might seem like I was trying to get their jobs or something mm -hmm. like that, you know, it's as absurd as that might be. And that it would feel a bit off to be writing critiques of people in the same sort of line of work that I'm doing. But yeah, it wasn't written at the time out of any sort of professional jealousy or something. It was written out of an intense frustration with several years of watching things go to shit. Mm. And 
not being able to turn on the TV because it made me want to punch it. And <laughs> I'd avoided listening to the TV commentary for quite a long time. I'd always have the radio on if I could and, and try to sync up the picture or whatever. But in that particular summer, it was when Michael Clark did his hamstring at Adelaide. And so he got popped on the commentary team for a couple Which of- Which is bizarre in itself. The next three test matches. Totally bizarre. He's commentating on the team that he's just been the captain of and that he's still notionally the returning captain of. So that was weird in itself. The Guardian, they were just having a changeover of sports editor at that point. So there were sort of temporarily people doing the job. And someone asked me to write a short piece, an 800-worder, on whether Clark was any good at commentary. So I listened for two tests. I sat there and listened to all of the commentary on nine. And it was just infuriating. It was mm. so bad, almost aside from Clark, who was and, – and that was what really stood out was that – so when I started writing, it was that Clark was the one who talked about the cricket and analysed the cricket talked tactics, talked players, you know, did what he was supposed to do. I had this thought that the most telling thing is that it's the most inexperienced guy in the room who's doing the job properly because he doesn't yet know that he's allowed to fuck around. Mm. You know, he doesn't know that he doesn't have to do the job properly yet, so he's still trying. You know, he's still being a nerd on his first day of school. Whereas the others, there were so many points in those hours of commentary that I listened to that were infuriating. And so when I started writing, it wasn't 800 words and it just kept going and going and going for quite a while. And I had a conversation with you at one point where I had a draft of two and a half thousand words or something. And you were like, write more, <laughs> do more. <laughs> You're like there's stuff in there that you've left out for space. And I was like, okay. I think that's my basic writing advice to everyone. Yeah. I, you could <laughs> yeah. fit an extra 2000 words. What I remember is you sent that piece to me and it was a really busy summer, wasn't it? Mm. We had India series and we had the World Cup coming up. And I yeah. didn't read it for ages. And then I reckon I was having a shit at the MCG one day. And I you, were, up you my texted phone. me and you said, I have time to read this because I'm having a shit. I, yeah. So I'm glad we both remember that. No, well, that's good. I'm pretty sure it was at the MCG. I think it was the middle stall. No, actually, maybe it wasn't the MCG. Maybe it was another ground. Anyway, mm -hmm. when I read it, I knew what they were going to say. I think my main advice to you was they were going to say, You're a cricket nerd. Mm -hmm. You don't understand TV. And so my big thing to you was you have to point out that this is not a bad broadcast for cricket fans. This is a bad broadcast if you're not a cricket fan. This is a bad mm. broadcast if you happen to be channel surfing and have just come along. But And you talk about it in the piece. You talk about the sort of shut up about cricket, you nerd. And you talk about the difference between Sky and Channel 9. And I think that for us cricket nerds, I think it was the difference between what Sky were broadcasting at that point and Channel 9 were broadcasting were completely different. But you talked about it in your piece that mm. Sky were only broadcasting for cricket fans mm -hmm. and Channel 9 were broadcasting for a general audience. There was a big difference there. The problem was that they were also failing a general audience as well. Mm. They weren't nailing any of those things. Right. They didn't want to be too dry and crickety, which you understand, but they also weren't explaining the cricket and they were also giving a completely insular broadcast that was all about people being mates in the commentary box and nobody who was outside that club, everyone was excluded. Everyone was excluded. It was a completely exclusive world and there was no warmth to it because listening to people who are great mates talk to each other about in-jokes is not warming. It's alienating. It's frigid. It's completely unappealing and, that, and that's what it was so consistently. Yeah. The reason that I think you and I care about this. And look, I know Cricket Australia were very upset with Channel 9 towards the end. They thought there was a lack of diversity, which they thought was hurting the game. They didn't like the way that the commentary was going. There was a lot of people talking about There's obviously that famous photo of all the white men lined up together yep. on the field. But and the famous response that says, look, one of them is wearing a hat. <laughs> So why cricket commentary matters, especially in Australia, and I think we've already proven how big it had gone, is it is the number one way to advertise the game. And at that point, I think Cricket Australia were like, we're doing everything we can. Mm. You and I both have our problems with various things that Cricket Australia have done. But fundamentally, they had no control over the one thing that was advertising the game to everyone at that point. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and, and that's, I guess, an inherent part of the relationship between a a rights provider and a rights holder is that you have to trust that the rights holder is going to do the right job. I mean, we saw that with the ICC at the last World Cup with the, the radio rights that were a complete disaster in terms of how that was broadcast because it ended up in the hands of various organisations who couldn't do it. And so this was the position that the very trusted established broadcaster was failing at what was being done. And I think it was also brought into sharper relief by the fact that Channel 10 
were doing a pretty good broadcast over on the other channel yeah. for the Big Bash, and so that really put that into sharp relief. Yeah, I think it's worth talking about Channel 10 a little bit too because they were still all mates. Yeah. And there was an atmosphere around it, but it always felt like the cricket was pushing it forward and you got incredible mm. analysis and then Flem would make a joke, but Flem would still line up the next person to... Uh, I'm saying Flem, so they used nicknames as well. It was Junior and all those sorts of things. But it just felt like the cricket was always the centre of that. And that was the less serious cricket as well. That wasn't tests. Yeah. Look, I didn't have the same love for Channel 10 that a lot of people did. They got talked up massively. People said that 10 broadcast is fantastic. I never thought it was fantastic. I thought it looked really good because it was in comparison to Channel 9. <laughs> so you're like, in some families, it's a lot easier to be the cool uncle than in other families, you know. But <laughs> I thought it had a lot of flaws and it had some of the same flaws. It did have that sort of the matey backslappy thing. But if you'd had that version of the Channel 9 broadcasters doing the Big Bash, they wouldn't have even understood the game. You know, they weren't up to date with how that kind of version of cricket worked. Whereas the fact that there was a bunch of, you know, I mean, slightly younger on average, I guess, commentators helped a lot. Just the fact they were different voices helped a lot. People were like, thank God, you know, we can mm. listen to somebody else. And so I think if they'd kept that same team going for several years, it, the relationship would have soured a bit. But it wasn't incredible, but it was better on just about every metric in terms of, as you said, just having a bit of freshness, having some more energy to it and making the actual broadcast move forward. For me, one of the reasons that Australia has a maybe not as diverse cricket culture as it should, but certainly more diverse than some other places around the world is because of Channel 9 cricket and how big a deal it was. So I played cricket in the northern suburbs of Melbourne out near Broadmeadows. And we would have Albanian kids and Italian kids and Greek kids. Often their parents didn't speak English at home. There was no cricket background that they had. Mm -hmm. And they would play cricket. And they had all come to cricket one way or another, kind of via test cricket, international mm. cricket, and Channel 9. And if you mm. go back, and I grew up in a cricket family, so I didn't need it as much as other people. But for those of them that didn't grow up in a cricket family, having Richie Benno and Ian Chappell and Tony Gregg explain things that are happening out on the field, mm. I always felt like that actually helped cricket. And if you look at the names of the cricketers that came through, Divinuto and Crazia, mm. Phil Hughes' uh, mother was Italian. Oh, massive, you know, Nofke, Klingleffer, Kadic. Kasperowitz, you know, you know, a lot of them, yeah. Um, Stark, it's still happening. A lot of them came from non-traditional cricket backgrounds. And I mm. always thought that when Channel 9 was at its best, which were probably maybe late 80s through the 90s, the commentators were still young and hungry. They had really good production. And uh, I thought that was when they were at their best. As, I think the broadcast got better after that, perhaps, but not the actual commentary. Mm -hmm. They actually helped grow us up as a cricket nation a little bit. We, were, yeah. we would learn things. And yes, Ian Chappell would say the same things over and over and over again. Even if you agreed with them, you were just like, do I have to hear about Les Favel again? <laughs> Stop talking about Les Favel. But you still got those little things. And all of those things, I think, really sort of helped Australian cricket. That just disappeared. And I think as a commentator, in some ways, you're on a hiding to nothing. If you're a regular commentator doing the broadcast over a longer period of time, you do have to repeat yourself. You know, you it's like the way that one of the things I was taught calling on radio was remember that someone has just turned on the radio every second. So you have to give the score a lot. You have to give the match position a lot, even though you've just done it. You have to keep doing it because people will turn on and, and turn off. So if you're doing it for 20 or 30 years and you're having to analyse the same sort of situations, you are going to have to repeat yourself. You will have to explain what the follow-on means or whatever it might be. And you will get shit for repeating yourself from people who've heard all 3,000 instances mm. of the times that you said that thing. But there are also all the other people who only heard you say it twice. So I think in a lot of ways, you can't be too critical of repetition. And striking that balance between, you know, not absolutely babying everybody, but actually explaining what's happening, it makes the game so much richer when you get that extra little bit of insight and suddenly as a viewer you can go, okay, now I'm looking out for this thing. And sometimes when it works, I remember Tony Gregg in this one day against England in 2003 or something, it was when Ian Blackwell was in the team 
he was batting and, and he hit a couple of shots and Tony Gregg said, you just want to move that mid-wicket around a bit squarer because he's going to go that direction against a spinner. They move the mid-wicket, off he goes in that direction, holes out a catch exactly to that spot. And you think when you've got someone who actually knows what they're talking about, they can bring the game to life in a way that won't happen otherwise. And and that is your job as a commentator. It's not just to describe things. It's not just to say, what a wonderful victory for our this team. It's not to have a great sound bite on the clip that'll get replayed. Like those things are part of it. But your job is to create a relationship between the person watching and the action in the middle. You're a bridge and you have to have a certain amount of humility to be a bridge. And, and that's the big issue in a lot of commentary is when that humility gets lost. You're not that important. Being the bridge is important. When Channel 9 finally lost the rights, how did you feel? I felt kind of conflicted. I was excited mm -hmm. because it meant new ways of broadcasting and uh, you yep. know the team would be dismantled a little bit. But also it was such a big part of our life. It, I feel a bit the same way with the BBC, and which I'm conflicted because I work with TalkSwap, but sometimes when people say, you know, BBC brought the game to everyone, mm. I also think that new voices and, and different ways of doing things is also a big help. But I do understand that Channel 9, BBC, these kind of broadcasters, they are huge within our game, whether we always like them yeah. or not. And consistency really makes a difference a lot of the time. Like there are very few things that don't change. And so having something that, that you can come back to with some degree of familiarity helps. I think I felt sort of relieved, well, but a little bit disappointed I, because I reckon for maybe two seasons before they lost the rights, that actually picked up, that actually got better. They had a new head of sport come in and it was a Tom Malone who came in there, changed things around quite a bit. They got rid of a bunch of the problems they'd had, so they started bringing in international callers again, which they just hadn't bothered doing for a number of years. You know, why? We've got Australians. <laughs> why do you want someone from Pakistan to talk about Pakistan? Crazy. So they got international callers in. They went back to two voices on the mic instead of having a, a whole couch full of people trying to talk over the top of each other. They just changed the direction a bit. They focused a bit more on the cricket, and it was better commentary. But there was still that sense of, you know, it's a bit like when you hear that one of your friends who's been in a really dull relationship for a really long time has broken up and you're like, oh, thank God. Time for both of them to get out there and do something else, you know? Mm. And, and so it was a bit like that. You were like, well, okay, it's probably for the best because we need something new. But I also thought that the deal in its place was shit and it remarkably has turned out to be shit because, you know, you put all of the Australian white ball stuff on pay TV only, which – legally should not be allowed to happen, except the communications minister at the time just didn't bother enforcing the law that already existed. So that shouldn't have been allowed to happen. So half of your products, you know, half your sports quarantined away on behind the paywall, and the other half is going to a network that doesn't really have a cricket history and, and doesn't necessarily get it. When they had a network in 10 who'd already done the training wheels bit, they'd done the big bash for a few years, they'd shown they could do it, and they were keen and hungry to do it. And to make it a whole new thing. And, and I thought that was just a massive missed opportunity at the time. And it's with no pleasure, but also no surprise that the Channel 7 and Fox deal has absolutely eaten shit even today when we're recording this, when those broadcasters are now refusing to pay the full amounts that they're supposed to pay and all of the extra money that CA was supposed to get, they're probably not going to get. So it was a dud of a deal. Leaving nine was probably good, but the deal they got in its place sucked very badly and he's going to continue to suck even worse. Yeah, it's even possible that Channel 10 or Channel 9 end up with the cricket back at this point. Yeah. Well, on free-to-air, certainly, I, like, I think Foxtel will death grip into, onto what they've got. But there's a pretty decent possibility that Seven might hand all those rights to one of the other networks if they can drum up some cash to pay for them. And so it won't happen for this Australian season, I don't think, but it could happen for a, a subsequent season. And so even that little break from nine might be good enough that if it did get back onto nine, they probably couldn't go back to doing things exactly the same way. They'd have to change things up. Just back to your piece specifically, you know, at this stage, you're a blogger, you're writing for Raw, obviously you've worked professionally, but more outside of cricket at that point, hadn't you? Yeah. I mean, I was writing for The Guardian a fair bit at that point and yeah. Wisdom and stuff. So I'd been on a few tours, like I was firmly enough in cricket, but I was still very much a newcomer. That piece, I think only maybe Barrett's piece on Patrick Patterson has ever gone as viral, as far as long form cricket writing goes. It must have shocked you and changed a lot about what was going on. It was certainly a surprise. I wasn't expecting it. 
I'd written a couple of very viral political things when I really was just blogging, when I'd write about Australian politics and not really hold anything back. And so I'd had that experience a couple of times of something really blowing up on the internet when suddenly your traffic numbers are in the hundreds of thousands at a time. And it's quite intimidating in a way. It's like Mm. this sudden intense rush of stimulus and you worry about it. You think like, God, I hope I've got it right, you know. <laughs> and you get the waves too. Like you get the yeah. waves of people telling you it's great and then an hour later it's everyone telling you it's horrible. It's an hour later that you're in Antifa. Mm. So that happened to me recently. But <laughs> yeah. you get those sorts of waves come through. So you're riding this incredible high. But the weird thing with that piece and given that I've spent most of my adult life online being exposed to other people's judgment of what I'm doing, that Channel 9 piece was the most one-way response that I've ever had. I got no negative feedback to it. I think I got six tweets, and I even remember the number from people who were like, I disagree with your article. <laughs> Literally six. Kind sir. <laughs> yeah, among thousands and thousands of people saying, oh, thank fuck, you actually said the thing that we've been wanting to say. And so, like, I knew it was a good piece. I spent a month writing it. I researched it very thoroughly. I really did the work on that one because I wanted to write the proper piece. I wanted to, I think the thing that you said to me was make sure you never have to write about this again. And that's what I did. I was like, this will be an essay. This will have everything in it. Mm. I will check everything a million times. I will make sure that it's absolutely spot on. And that's what I did. So when it went out, I felt very confident. I was like, I know I've got this right. And I know that I've caught the mood from a lot of other people who I've read and, and listened to over the last few years. You know, I thought this will go pretty well but I didn't. It was the most read thing on The Guardian for three days running, which doesn't happen. You know, you don't get the same piece day after day. Well, especially The Guardian is not, I know there's been a big push for The Guardian to be Australian, but still not an Australian publication. Certainly at that point. I mean, Guardian Oz had only kicked off in 2013, and so that was the London newsroom didn't really pay the Australian operation much attention at that point. So I think it was a bit of a surprise for them as well. But look, it felt good because I was really confident that I'd got it right. And I was confident that, you know, this isn't the most important issue in the world, but it does matter. Mm. You know, I thought it did matter. And I thought I'd I'd try to explain why it mattered. And people were getting that. People understood why it mattered. And and that it did help create some basis for, for change because the response to it made it clear that this wasn't just an angry guy having a pop at you. This was something that so many people agreed with. They had such a groundswell of support that something did need to change. And within a very small field, it was able to affect some sort of change. Behind the scenes, there had already been some people who worked in Channel 9 who were starting to feel that way. And obviously some of them reached out to you as well. But it was at that point, I think that it was so universal that something had gone Mm. so wrong. It's incredible to think that such a big part of Channel 9's broadcasting was allowed to become that with so many. Yeah. I mean, how many vested interests must there have been, right, you know, Channel 9 and in cricket? And it just kept going. So you, when your piece came out, it wasn't what I expected. I expected the public outcry. I, as, same as you, I didn't expect as many people, but I certainly expected that people would go, finally, someone's nailed the Channel 9 thing. But what I expected really was Channel 9 to go, now nah, he's wrong. And they did not. A lot of people at Channel 9 agreed with you. Mm. Yeah, I mean, not explicitly, you know, it's not like they rang me up and said, great job, you know. And not line by line either. There were things that they disagreed with. but Well, of course, because kind of the point was that I wrote it in a, there were some punches thrown (laughs) and that was deliberate to put the point across because you can make the argument politely and it's not going to be listened to. And I, I knew that. Like I knew that I could make all of these points in a more refined way and it wouldn't work. It wouldn't mm. wouldn't have any effect. They wouldn't care. So in order to make a reader feel a bit of a jolt and, and make them interested and make them sit up and make them want to send the piece to someone else, you, you need to be straightforward. And I also felt like I wasn't pumping it up to be controversial. It was it was this like was that, real. Yeah. This was really how I felt. I was being forthright about how I actually felt about it. So and it did get through to people. It did actually make some of the people who needed to sit up and take notice, take notice. And they didn't speak to me about it, but I know that that happened. You know, I've had it relayed to me that basically the view was, you know, at higher levels at nine was we need to make sure that nobody writes a piece like this again. We need to make sure that our broadcast doesn't invite this. And 
I mean, that's all I could have asked for. That's exactly the kind of response that I would have wanted. I don't need them to come and give me a certificate, but if it made something better, you know, who cares how it comes about? Thank you very much for coming on the podcast, sir. It's been a pleasure. Thank you for listening. You can follow my guest at Jeff Lemon Sport. I am also on the Twitters. I'm on Instagram as well. I never talk about that, probably because I don't care. Please review this show on Apple Podcasts or anywhere that you can review it. Social medias. Make a TikTok about it. Not if you're in India, obviously, but share it out there. It really does help, and it makes me feel better about myself. And this podcast is made possible by the people who support us at Patreon. So thank you all very much. Red Inca is made by me, Jared Kimber. Nick McCorriston pleases all of your ears. And our theme tune is called The Prisoner by the Red Crickets. <laughs>